بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر فرینڈ ہوپ یو ہیڈ اے ویری پروڈکٹیو ویک اینڈ وی ان شاء اللہ آر گوئنگ ٹو بگن آر سیشن رائٹ ناؤ اینڈ ٹو ڈے دا ٹاپک از انٹروڈکشن ٹو گاڈ اور دا گاڈ آف دا قرآن اینڈ بائی دس دیر شوڈ ناٹ بی اینی مس کنسیپشن دیٹ دا گاڈ آف دا قرآن از سم تھنگ ڈفرینٹ فرام دا گاڈ آف دا بائبل اور دا گاڈ آف اینی ادر ریلیجن سو واٹ is being presented here basically uh, is an introduction to God the way the Quran presents it and because of the fact that we have the Quran as the final document of God, the final testament of God. So therefore we are uh, very certain that whatever we find in the book of God, the last book of God, is actually a very, very true introduction of God. So we start off by uh, reading some of the passages and then inshallah you'll be attempting some of the questions which relate to the uh, to these passages so the pattern i'm going to adopt today is uh, read the uh, in arabic and i'll ask uh, uh, one of you to read the translation and then we'll go to the uh, comprehension questions so <clears throat> can i ask uh, nida aziz please uh, okay first let me read out the text before you so once i'm done nida you're requested to Uh, read the translation. So the text is وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ زُهُورِهِمْ زُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَخْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا أَن تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّا كُنَّا عَنْ هَذَا غَافِلِينَ أَوْ تَقُولُوا إِنَّمَا أَشْرَكَ آبَاؤُنَا مِنْ قَبْلُ وَكُنَّا وَكَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ So, Nida, could you please uh, read the translation? And remember when your Lord brought forth from the loins of the progeny of Adam their children and made them testify against themselves. He said, Am I not your Lord? They replied, We bear witness that you are. This we did lest you should say on the day of judgment. We had no knowledge of that. or present the excuse. Our forefathers had already adopted idolatry and we later became their children. So will you destroy us on account of what these false doers did? And thus do we explain our revelations and so that they may return to the right path. Thank you for that, Nidha. So we've started this uh, lesson of introduction to God and uh, Nidha Aziz has just uh, finished reading the translation of the first text. Now we go on to the second text, uh, the second passage. Uh, this is basically uh, Surah 59, which is Surah Hashr and verses 22-24. I'll read out the text before you and then I'll ask one of you to read the translation. So the words are, هُوَ اللَّهُ الَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّهُ عَالِمُ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَ هُوَ الرَّحْمَانُ الرَّحِيمُ هو الله الذي لا اله الا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الاسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والارض وهو العزيز الحكيم so i'm going to request hasan Uh, to please read out the translation. He is God, whom there is no other deity. He knows the unseen and the manifested. He is the most gracious, the ever merciful. He is God, besides whom there is no other deity. He is sovereign. Mm-hmm. He is the sovereign Lord, the Holy One, peace in eternity, the giver of peace, the guardian, the mighty one, the all-powerful. the Most High, exalted in God above whom they associate with whom they associate with Him. He is God, the Architect, the or- Originator, the Modeler. All good names are His. All that is in the heavens and earth give glory to Him. And He is the Mighty, the Wise One. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hassan. So these were verses 22 to 24 from Surah 59. which is Surah Hashr. Let us now go on 
to the third uh, verse. Uh, this is uh, verse 255 of Surah Baqarah. It is also famously known as the Ayatul Kursi and uh, many of us uh, also know it by heart. So in any case, I'm just going to read out the text before you first. So it says, Allahu la ilaha illahu al-hayyul qayyum la ta'khuzuhu sinatum wa la nawm lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard man zallazi yashfa'u indahu illa bi'iznih ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum wa la yuhituna bi shay'in min ilmihi illa bima sha'a wasi'a kursiyuhu as-samawati wal ard wa la yauduhu hifzuhuma wa huwa al-aliyul azim okay i'm going to request dania sharjil if you if you could please translate the read, read the translation for us so isa can i request you to please read the translation okay god there is no god but he the living the sustainer neither slumber nor sleep overtakes him mm-hmm. all this is in the heavens and the earth belong to him who can intercede with him for someone except by his permission he knows what lies before them and what is after them and without his will they cannot grasp any part of his knowledge his domain prevails in the heavens and the earth and their protection does not bury him in the slightest way and he is exiled and the glorious one so uh so it's his dominion uh which prevails uh, i think you read out domain and the the, the last of the, well the second last of his attributes is exalted so thank you very much for that isa uh and uh you can see that these are the three passages which describe uh, god of course there are uh, other areas other passages in the quran other instances which have a, uh, some introduction to god but uh, what i can say is that these three uh, basic passages or three set of sets of verses uh, they give you enough introduction to god and uh, this is something which of course uh, can be built upon once you realize that the introduction that you have had from god in these verses Uh, will make you realize uh, that first of all of course we cannot have any idea of his being the way he is uh, you could just cannot know his physical shape his physical form and that is why uh, we have uh, the quran saying at one place laysa ka mislihi shay which means there's no one like him so we understand people we understand the how a person is if we can liken him or compare him to someone else but about the about god almighty god himself says that there is no one like me so therefore you will not be able to grasp my physical being so the only introduction to god which the quran gives us is actually twofold and one of them here is through his attributes we'll also study another introduction of god uh, perhaps next week which tells us that we can also appreciate god we can also understand god by some of his practices by some of his dealings that he does uh, with human beings so this is uh, your first introduction to god which relates to his attributes and these attributes uh, as you can see when you just read the translation they stand out and give us a fair idea uh, of how the almighty or how the almighty that we have in our mind what are his attributes and what are his traits so uh, now we were going to discuss uh, each of these passages in a, in a little more detail so that uh, we can delve into some of uh, these attributes with these verses mentioned and uh, uh, make ourselves comfortable with the notion that how the god that we all know and that the, the god that exists around us and the god with whom we are connected or we are trying to connect in a more meaningful way how uh, he actually has uh, created us uh, and how actually we relate to him so what i'm going to ask you is that you please study the first of these passages and uh, uh, the first passage has is is a very very unique passage and if you uh, read it once again uh, you'll find out that it has a very unique message this is something which has not been mentioned in any place else in the quran this is only the place which is surah araf which is verse 7 uh, surah 7 and verses 172 to 174 so this is a place where there is a very unique mention regarding certain uh, 
a certain thing that happened. And this gives us some detail about that. So I would like now uh, each of you to spend a few moments in once again reading this verse uh, by your own selves. I'll give you a couple of minutes. And then I'd like to ask each of you, what do you think is the message of this uh, of these uh, of the sets of verses and of course uh, when you see these verses as you can uh, clearly read them and understand them uh, perhaps you will uncover a very deep meaning and get to understand how we actually relate to God so please take a few moments a few minutes and uh, start reading this verse once again these verses once again and as soon as you do please raise your hands so that we can ask you ask you what you have understood. If there is any uh, dif difficulty in translation, any vocabulary that you need uh, to be understood, you can ask uh, any of the words that might not be clear. But remember, it's verse 172 to 174 of Surah Araf, which is the seventh surah. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask, sir, what is meant by lion? of the progeny of Adam. So this is a metaphorical, uh, symbolic sort of a thing. Loins, of course, mean the backs uh, or the, 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 the behinds of, uh, of the progeny of uh, Adam. And of course, this relates to a, it's something which is symbolic. So taking out the, the children of Adam from their, from their uh, loins actually signifies the fact that their souls were uh, extracted before they were given birth, all progeny of Adam. So each one of us, we don't remember this incident, but it happened that before the Almighty created all of us, he actually took out our souls and, uh, and we faced him uh, in the form of our, uh, of our, of our sp uh, spirits and our, our spiritual self. Our, our body was not there with us, but in our, in our soul form, we had this conversation with him. I think this should make it easier. And I and can also see Amira uh, has raised her hand. Amira, could, could you share what you understood? Yes, yes I could. Uh, so, the, what I understood is that we were all made, where our souls were all promised that we all testify that we bear one God. So we can we can't give the excuse that we don't know that there is one God. So this feeling in in us that we know that there is a God present, mm -hmm. and you know sometimes even atheists say that they that they're trying to find a God, they're trying to find a path or something. Mm -hmm. That feeling is basically of that promise that we made. Okay. Um. Yeah. So now, uh, uh, if, if I can just ask you a little more about this, that uh, I, I I think none of us remembers that this thing happened. So yes. if we don't remember this thing to happen, then how can uh, people, if they say that uh, there is a God and we had this conversation with him, if it is not our memory, then how can it be an argument in favor of God? I don't think this can be used as an argument, but it's this, like when people start, when people start searching for God, when people start searching for the right thought, then they have this feeling that this is the right religion or this is what they feel as, is, as if it's right. So I think that promise didn't remain as a memory inside us, it remained as a feeling. Okay, that's fair enough. Uh, okay, I think uh, I saw Zoya uh, raise her hand. Did I see correctly? Because I can't see her anymore. Zoya, did you want to say something? I did, but I've just been, I, when I was listening, I got another point that I want to consider before I speak. Okay, so uh, let me ask someone, uh, Anusha, Anusha, could you could you could you give us your opinion that what you've understood, or would you agree with Amira, or you have some something different that you have understood? I mostly just think that it states that the excuses that you give yourselves that oh um, my family has been practicing like in this case it says idolatry for centuries, but there is that kind of documented truth where you have been told that you have a God and so there's no real way for you to deny that. Mm -hmm. It's you do, it's just some form of I wouldn't say ignorance, but you're kind of convincing yourself of something that there is proof against. 
So, so this is something similar to what Amira also said that uh, uh, there is some background to it, and all of us have this this God connection, uh, and uh, we, we we happen to do this that we made a pledge, and therefore it, it seems that uh, uh, the con conception of God or the vision of God is is is, is something that is known to us. Sina, what do you think? I think that I agree with what they said before as well. Yeah, I think that. Okay. And what about Rayan Vaidi? I also feel like there's this uh, like there's this part which talks about how he is mm -hmm. on a higher level than we are. Mm -hmm. So um Okay. Yeah, when it says like neither slumber nor sleep overtakes him in um okay. I think it's the last the last part. But um, yeah, that's what I think. Okay, that is fine. Uh, okay, uh, what about Iman? Iman, would you like to share what you've understood? Um, I think thousands of populations like that time were like mixed. And then the prophets are like examples, like people who suffered in order for, to gain like their lost companions mm -hmm. so they could be like on the right path. Mm -hmm. Not so sure. Okay, that is fine. You see, uh, as I said, the, the best part is that all of you are trying. And we, as human beings, we, we have to, uh, I mean, it's, it's something what you call, you never give up. You keep on trying. It doesn't matter if something uh, that comes to your mind might not be the exact uh, understanding. But the fact is that you are trying is, is, is really something which is very heartening. Okay, can I ask uh, Ramla and Musa? Uh, from what I understand, it's primarily talking about how all of humanity has already been given uh, the primal knowledge of that God exists, just as all of us from birth know that uh, we have a mother and an existence. Mm -hmm. So that is a very uh, strong point that you have made. That I think what you're implying is that all of us have been given birth by our mothers, but we haven't have never witnessed that incident. We've never seen ourselves coming out of our mothers. It's only our environment, our relatives, the people around us, and of course the traits that we carry. They immediately give this very strong uh, uh, reasoning that such and such a lady is your mother. So that is uh, something very similar, perhaps, which might have happened before humanity might have been created. Okay. Uh, uh, Samin and Mahin. I think we both largely agree with what's already been said, that there is a sort of intrinsic nature in every one of us that believes in the oneness of mm -hmm. God. Right. Um, yeah. Basically okay. That. And Sana Iqbal? Honestly, I don't really understand the main meaning of this verse. I'm just like going off what others are saying. Mm -hmm. So I don't really have an answer for your question at the moment. Okay, that's that's brilliant. So now that's a beautiful answer itself because uh, uh, it shows that how hard you are still trying. And I do admit that this is not a very easy verse of the Quran because, of course, it has a certain symbolic uh, meaning, and that symbolic meaning has to be gauged with some effort and understanding. But um, most of you, or at least uh, a majority of you, who have expressed your opinion regarding this verse are very near the exact uh, original uh, meaning or the exact original understanding. So just let me give you some overview and some background. So you see that, uh, as I said earlier on, and let me just uh, also sh uh, share the verse once again so that you have the verse in, in front of you and we can go by the verse. So see, it says that, and remember when your Lord brought forth from the loins of the progeny of Adam their children and made them testify against themselves. So first, of course, this is something when a verse tells you to remember. So uh, the first answer that I come uh, that comes to my mind is that how can I remember uh, something which I, uh, I mean, I never was a witness to. So on such cases, uh, you have to understand this that this is a very common style of the Quran, and when it says uh, remember, it's basically a reminder of something so obvious that even if you've not witnessed it, it seems that it is it is something which is an obvious reality. So the Quran, uh, when it says remember, it does not always refer to things that you have already seen and you remember uh, the way we do. It says remember, the word uh, remember also is used when it reminds us of something which is so obvious 
that even if you have not seen it, we consider it to be the truth. And then the next part that you need to understand is uh, uh, brought forth from the loins of the progeny of Adam. Of course, the word loin here is, as I just explained to one question, that it's, it's very symbolic in nature. And the progeny of Adam, of course, means all mankind. So, uh, although the word soul is not mentioned here, uh, the word that the Quran uses is Bani Adam. Bani Adam it means the children of Adam. So, but uh, it is very clear from this uh, symbolism uh, in which it says that the that the children of Adam were brought forth from the loins of uh, of Adam. So this has to be the sole part of our existence. And then what? Look what it says. It says that. Uh, in fact, let me also explain this first. That when it says the children of Adam, it actually says that all of us, every single person who was to be born from Adam to the last person who would die, all of them before they cr were created by the Almighty, before in fact Adam was perhaps, uh, he began his, his uh, life here, uh, all of humanity, the souls of every person, they were brought to the presence of God. And then look what the verse says, وَأَشْهَدَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ They were made to testify against themselves. So uh, it, they were actually made to give this uh, testimony, this argument that there is something that they have to now witness and therefore give as an evidence. And what was that? The Almighty said, am I not your Lord? Now this actually shows that it was a real time incident. It is something which happened, something which actually took place, but it has been erased from our memories. We don't know that, we don't remember that it had happened. But the Quran tells us that this was an event that happened, that the souls of each and every one of us, they were called in the presence of God. The God himself, the Almighty himself called them. And he said, uh, am I not your Lord? Which of course means that I am God and I have created you. Uh, so do you acknowledge that? So we can see that mankind at that time uh, were able to see in some form or the other uh, that we cannot actually explain at this moment that how we saw God, but it, say, it, it does tell us that we had this conversation with, uh, with God and this was a real-time conversation. It was not something virtual. It was not something in a dream or a vision. It, was, it took place as, a, as an event. And look what the uh, man, all of us replied. None of us remembers this, but all of us replied, we bear witness that you are, which means that all of us actually conversed with God before coming into this world. And all of us said, yes, you are our Lord. And then uh, it, it is said that this we did, lest you should say on the day of judgment, we had no knowledge of that. So God says that we made the souls of humanity testify and uh, acknowledge myself, this is what God is speaking, that I am their Lord and therefore this should not be an excuse on the day of judgment when people rise up against uh, before me and then they say, well, we don't know whether there is a God or not and we don't have any uh, idea if there is a God or not. So what is being said here that they are, you are left with no excuse because this is a real time conversation and you acknowledge that. And then it goes on to say or present the excuse our forefathers had already adopted idolatry and we later became their children. So the second excuse, which will not be accepted, is that, well, we were in this world and we found our own fathers and forefathers in our own society, uh, worshipping other deities, worshipping other idols. So we thought that this is something that we should also follow because that's what they are doing. So the Almighty says that this excuse shall also be, not be accepted because, uh, uh, because you yourself testified there is a God. And because of the fact, mostly, uh, if you see, all of us, when we give excuses, uh, one of the big excuses that we have is that, well, I found my parents doing this. I found my uncle doing this. I found my granddad doing this. And this sort of becomes a assurance that whatever you're doing is correct. So here the Almighty is telling us, and remember the addresses particularly of this verse were the idolaters of Arabia who existed in very large numbers when this verse was revealed. Of course, it relates to us as well. But directly, they were there and they were engaged in heinous forms of idolatry. You know that they were uh, close to 365 idols within the Kaaba, within the, within the house of God in Mecca. 
And uh, so idolatry was a very common religion. It was the religion of Arabia. So in the presence of this, the, the Almighty says that people who indulge in polytheism, people who indulge in, in, in idolatry of any form, uh, if they say on the day of judgment that we have no knowledge of God, or if they say that we found our forefathers doing that and therefore we are following them, this will not be accepted. And then it says that, uh, uh, and it says that, uh, would you destroy us on account of what these, these false doers did? So, of course, you will have not, you will not have that excuse to present to God. Because God has already made this clear to you that it was you yourself who said so. And then the Almighty says, And thus we do explain our revelation so that they may return to the right path. So this is uh, one of the very often repeated verses of the Quran, the last verse, which is verse 174. It tells us that in this way, God makes things simpler for us. Uh, it eases, he eases out the understanding of a lot of complex facts so that we are able to appreciate the truth. So in a nutshell, what you can say is that all of us witness the Almighty in our soul form and we talk to him and he actually replied. And therefore, uh, on the day of judgment, if we rise up before him and we present the excuse that we had no knowledge who God was or that we found our forefathers worshipping different gods and therefore we are just following them, God says that this will not be acceptable. So in other words, as one of you also just said, that atheism or disbelief in God or believing in many gods. So you see, all these are forms of negation of God. This will not be accepted as an excuse. And as far as the question is concerned, that then why is it that uh, we can present this as an excuse when we, have, we don't even remember this incident? So as, as I think one of you have just answered, uh, that uh, basically it was a real-time incident which was made to be erased, which was erased from our memories, just as the uh, other birth has been erased from our memories. We don't know uh, our mother, uh, so to speak, uh, when we were born, but it was our environment, it was our surroundings which told us that this is our mother. So in a very similar way, when we come into this world and we see how everything is and also we look into our own intuition, we find that there is a conception of God found in our own intuition, in our own inner self. And so that real-time conversation with God is something uh, whose reflection we find in our intuition, in our inner self, that we, are being, we have been created. We are not our creators ourselves. Someone has created us. And the whole environment uh, alongside us, the people who live uh, along us, the, the, the creation of this earth, the way it has been created, the creation of this universe just tells us that someone has created us. And if someone has created us, then of course we need to find out who that person is. And that is where the next set of verses comes in and introduce God. I mean, we do have a conception of God as a result of this conversation, but who exactly is that God? What, is, what are his attributes? So they are going to be mentioned in the next set of verses, uh, which we are now just going to read more deeply. So the basic message of this, uh, the first passage is that none of us can have an excuse before the Almighty uh, to deny him when we meet him up. And uh, because God says that your inner being and your outer uh, self, I mean, which refers to the outer uh, aspect of yourself, which is the universe around you, the world around you, both of them testify. And because of the fact that this incident has been erased from your memory because the Almighty wanted to make it a test. For had this not been erased, it would have been no test at all. See, if we had remembered that incident, then the test would no longer could have take, taken place because, the, because all of us would have acknowledged immediately. So God wanted us to, to, to test us actually by making this incident uh, by making it unremembered, by, by making us unlearn this incident and then making us pass through a certain trial and also letting us know from our inside and from the world outside that he exists. So thank you very much for this small discussion that we have, have had, just had on this verse. Now we go on to the next verse, uh, which is verse, which is exact, in fact, three uh, verses, which is from Surah 59 to Surah Surah Hashr. And uh, so, uh, as I said, 
uh, as far as the first set of verses is concerned, it tells us there is someone by the name of God. There is a God. But who exactly is that God? What are his attributes? The best introduction to God's attributes is this particular set of verses which I have just presented before you. So uh, what I'd like now you to do as a comprehension question is that make a list of attributes. You see, you find God's attributes, Rahman, Rahim, etc., etc. All of them are present here. I've, I've uh, deliberately not uttered some of them which, uh, which are mentioned before Rahman or Rahim. And of course, there are some others. And you'll find a whole bunch of uh, these names. Uh, and these names actually signify as attributes. So what I'd like you to do is pick out those names, write them on a piece of paper, or maybe write them on your computers or anywhere else, and also try to relate them to the corresponding Arabic in the original. Because uh, these are mostly one words. At times, these, some of the attributes of God are explained in, a, in the form of a clause. Uh, so what I'd like you to do is to underline the particular uh, translation of an attribute in Arabic and so that you are able to relate the English translation uh, with the word which exists in the original for that English translation because they are these in fact are the attributes of God which you are going to encounter when you read the Quran uh, profusely. If you just are able to master these attributes, you'll find that as far as God is concerned, these are his major attributes. Of course, there are some other attributes as well. But these are his major attributes that are spread all over the Quran. And if you understand these attributes, uh, you will understand how you and God are related to each other. So please begin now. Remember, you have to pick up the attributes of God and also the Arabic text. Uh, and, and just see that which attribute corresponds to which part of the Arabic text. And just jot it down. Because here I'd like uh, you to actually do this exercise um, as a case in point. And then if there is anything that you uh, would not be understanding, for example, vis-a-vis uh, -vis some of the translation, you are uh, very welcome to uh, discuss the translation. But this is a very important exercise vis-a-vis uh, -vis the fact that this will make you discover how you can relate to God. So Musa, you have a question? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, go ahead. Sir, I wanted to ask that uh, why did God even make it remain in our soul or in our intuition? Uh, why didn't he remove it completely from our lives? So, this I, uh, let me ask, answer this question as you finish this exercise. I'll take up this question together with the, with the, with the uh, assignment that you're just doing. And we'll take up, uh, because I, right. I need to explain okay. a little more of that. So please do uh, attempt this, this second comprehension question first. So you have to be careful in picking and choosing these attributes. <clears throat> Remember, some of them are one word attributes and some of them are in the form of a couple of words, like a clause or a phrase. And this is the most comprehensive introduction to the attributes of God at one place. You find these attributes dispersed in the Quran. But if you would like to know of one place where all these attributes occur in groups, it is this place. Okay, uh, now we're just going to have a small discussion on this verse and see what you've come up with. And do remember that uh, it, it is of paramount importance that you just uh, come up with whatever you have uh, actually underlined. Inshallah, uh, you'll be able to grasp a me deeper meaning when you uh, hear this discussion from the rest of the participants. So, can I ask Zirak, uh, or I couldn't see Rayan, you had raised your hands. I think that your hands are no longer raised. But let me start with Zirak. Zirak, would you, would you please pick up the attributes or let us know what the attributes are in their corresponding Arabic? Uh, it talks about how no, uh, how no one else is on the same rank as God. No, now, actually, uh, you have to enlist them. So one, two, three, four. It's like enlisting those attributes. Attributes means the names of God, which are mentioned by way of a trait that he has. Let me give you an example if you're finding any difficulty. For example, look at the first clause. It says, There is He is God besides whom there is no other deity, which means there is no other God. So first, the first attribute that you can think of is that he is 
the one and only. There is, there is no one parallel to him. What we uh, actually refer to him when we are reading Surah Ikhlas, we say, Kul Allahu Ahad. So basically, Hu Allahu Lazi La Ilaha Illahu, which is translated as He is God, besides whom there is no other deity, there is no other God. So that would signify the first attribute of God, as mentioned in these verses, that He is one and alone. So in other words, uh, the, the, it's the aspect of monotheism that we're talking about. So this is how this is the, this is how I meant you to actually underline or pick and choose uh, that by by enlisting actually uh, uh, in the form of a, a column maybe or a row one two three four five and then correspondingly all these attributes. So if this was not very clear, I have tried to make it clear once again. So Fatima and Ariva, uh, if you've done uh, this on the same line or the same pattern, please share with us your understanding. Um, yes, we listed the characteristics, but we didn't get most of the Arabic. Um, okay, that is fine. Let's let's start off one by one. Yeah, the first one was one and only, which you mentioned was la ilaha illallah. Most gracious, ever merciful, which we think is so, uh, so. Didn't you miss something before that? The unseen, the manifest. Is that the one? So it says. Uh, it's, it says. He knows the unseen and the manifest. Alimul ghaib wa alimul shahada, which means that he is a knower of what is, and, and the unseen and manifest is with relation to mankind. So, what we cannot see, or what is something which is hidden from us, so he knows both what is seen and the unseen. So, what we can, uh, what is known to us and what is unknown to us, for example, uh, there are certain things that we only know in our in our in our hearts, and we we have certain realities hidden. So he would know even that, and he would know what is manifest. So basically, there are these are two attributes that he knows what is the unseen, that is one, and he knows what is the seen, or what is the manifest. So yeah, okay. So 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 uh, we have three attributes before you reach the uh, fourth one, which is the most gracious. Yeah, the most gracious, and then it mentions ever merciful, mm -hmm. which we think is Rahman or Rahim. Mm -hmm. I think it's mentioned there. Right. Um, and they mention again that there is no other deity except him. Mm -hmm. um, they mention he's uh, so, so this is, uh, what you can see is that this has actually been repeated. So we had the same verse with it, which with this passage began. Wallahu lazi la ilaha illahu. And once again, the next verse starts off with exactly the same words. And you know what? When the Quran repeats something in exactly the same words, one of the one of the reasons for that is that it wants to stress that. So the oneness yeah. of the Almighty, the fact that He's one and alone, you can see this is the only attribute which is repeated uh, the way we, we find it uh, in this passage. Although there is another one, but primarily in in in, a, in the form of a clause. So that's a repetition. Yes, please go, go ahead now. Yeah. Sovereign uh, Lord, which is Malik, I believe. So the, the correct uh, pronunciation would be Malik. So Malik is Malik. something who is the owner. Malik is someone uh, uh, which actually is referring here that he's a sovereign. Yeah. Okay. Um, holy, the Holy One. Right. Giver of peace. So the Holy One, what's the uh, corresponding word in Arabic? Uh, I, I don't know about, I don't know so, that. So it's pronounced as Quddus, Al Quddus. It's written right after Malik. Al Malik, Al Quddus. Okay, yeah. please go ahead. <clears throat> the um, giver of peace. And what's the, uh, what about something which, bef what was before that? Peace in eternity. Yeah. So what's the Arabic word? So, um, the thing is, on the Word document, I can't really read it clearly, okay, so okay. I've only picked up the ones that I kind of already know. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, uh, inform you that the Arabic is As-Salam. So As-Salam would be the giver of peace. Uh, sorry, it's peace in entirety, not the giver of peace, that's peace in entirety. Okay, please go ahead then, the next verse, the next word. Um, the giver of peace. Right, so that is Al-Mu'min. Yeah. Okay. Um, the guardian. Right. So that is Al Muhaymin. Yeah. The mighty one. Okay. That is Al Aziz. 
Yeah, and that's mentioned twice. That's mentioned at the end again. Yeah, absolutely correct. Um, the all powerful. Yeah. So that is Al Jabbar. Yeah, Al, yeah, Al Jabbar. Mm -hmm. um, the most high. Okay, so that is Al Mutakabbir. Right. Yeah. The architect. So uh, there is a sentence which says, Subhanallah, Amma Yushrikun. So it says that when God has all these uh, attributes, so exalted is God above whom they associate with him. So because, uh, of course, this is not an attribute of God. It's just an explanation of the fact that because of these names or these attributes that we have just read, uh, there is n there's no one who can, you can associate with him because of the fact there is no parallel to him. There is no pair to him. And also the fact that as far as having a partner is concerned, only God could have disclosed this to us that he has a partner. And the in the absence of such a disclosure, we cannot associate anyone with God. Yes. Okay, please go on. Yeah. The most high. Okay. For that, we have the word. Yeah. Um, the architect. The architect. So that is the, the Arabic word is Al-Khaliq. Yep. Okay. The originator. The originator is, which in Arabic is Al-Bari. Right. And the next one. The modeler. The modeler. Okay. That is Al-Musavvir. Al-Musavvir means uh, the modeler. Okay. And then go on. And the wise one, which is Hakim, I believe. Absolutely correct. So Hakim is the wise one. And there is a repetition of the word Al-Aziz, which means the mighty. The mighty. Okay. So uh, as far as uh, these attributes are concerned, I think uh, you've brilliantly outlined them. So, okay, this, the second part of this exercise is that you, uh, uh, those, those of you who have not been able to pick all these names, I'm sure uh, with this uh, discussion, this brief discussion, you might have picked all these uh, names now. So, you see, the next part is that we, how do we relate ourselves to this God who has these attributes? What, or what exactly is the consequence? That's now I'm going to very briefly explain to you because this is actually the crux of uh, these verses that uh, this, this is one thing to find out who God is. And the, another thing is to find out when once we have understood his attributes, then how his attributes can actually or should actually influence our lives. So the first thing is, which means that he is one and alone. And therefore, it is he that we have to worship. We cannot associate anyone uh, with us. He knows the seen and the unseen which of course means that everything that we do is in his knowledge and we just cannot escape his knowledge in any way, uh, which would actually tell us that all his attributes regarding uh, our, his interaction with human beings, they are, uh, they are found in a, in a very complete shape because if he has knowledge of our seen and unseen, that would mean that if he takes us to account, if he calls us to account in the next world, they will nothing, there will be nothing missing from his knowledge. So we have to be aware that when we are doing something alone and when no one is watching us, we have to understand that God is God is watching us. So the effect of this attribute or these attributes directly on us should be that when we are doing something which is bad, uh, of course, that is something our all our conscience will always tell us. But at the same time, we have to have this, uh, this uh, imagination that someone is watching us. We are not alone. Maybe we are alone. Uh, there's no other human being. But as far as God is, the, is concerned, he's, he's watching us. So this is the impact that this attribute should have on us. And then it says Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. So both these uh, attributes, you can see, they are very closely linked. And the word Rahim, which you have, I think, encountered in your Urdu language and in Arabic also, is, is the root of both these words, which means that there is a lot of mercy in him. Now, there is a difference between a Rahman and Rahim, a slight difference, although both of them have this uh, ring of mercy. So Rahman would mean a, someone who is, who, is, who is always there like a gushing fountain to envelop a, pe a person who comes to him with his mercy. And it, it, it signifies a lot of uh, exuberance, it, it, a lot of uh, enthusiasm, something which is, as I said, can be compared to a gushing fountain. And Rahim actually signifies that his mercy is not transient because you see when things they gush forth, they finish immediately. But Rahim actually tells us that his mercy is not going to finish. It's something that's going to continue. 
So while the word Rahman uh, lets us know about one facet of his mercy, which is that he is extremely merciful, he is extremely gracious, but that mercy, mercy and grace is not just for a particular period of time. It's not going to end because like a gushing fountain, people often think that when things go out in a way that they, are, they, they do so in such a, such a fast way, then one day they will cease. So this, this, these two, uh, I would say, attributes, when they occur in tandem, when they occur uh, one after the other, and you'll find this, uh, of course, when we read Bismillah Rahman Rahim, uh, almost in, before every surah, and when we do a lot of tasks, so we say Bismillah Rahman Rahim, and because of the fact that this is something that we encounter a lot, so it is always good to have this uh, understanding that God's mercy is there to envelop us, and His mercy is not going to end. It's going to be there forever. And then we have a repetition of the same clause or the same uh, sentence which, with, with which the first verse began. It says, There is no God except Him. Again, signifying the fact that we just cannot worship other gods beside Him. The fact is that uh, had there been other gods, the Almighty says, I would have been the first one to inform you. So in the absence of the, any such information, if you are associating other deities, other gods with me, it only means that you are blatantly lying. And that, that is why at another place, uh, this is also called iftaral Allah. Iftaral Allah means to impute falsehood to God, to tell lies about God. And then it says Al-Malik. Of course, Al-Malik, is he is the king. He is the person who is the sovereign. Uh, this gives us the impression that he is all in all. No one shares his authority. No one shares his power. So therefore, we have to turn to him. So the effect of this this uh, attribute is, is that we forget about other kings, we forget about other authorities. The sole authority that we need to submit as far as morals are concerned, as far as, as, far as certain metaphysical uh, directives are concerned, it is the single God who is the sovereign. He is our real sovereign. So just as we relate to a sovereign uh, in a way that we, we trust that sovereign the most, this particular attribute should have this effect on us. And then it says Al-Quddus. He is the Holy One. Now, Kudus actually means someone who is pure from inside. So, a natural consequence of this attribute is that he would like us to be pure as well from inside. So, Kudus is someone who is extremely pure, extremely, uh, I would say, holy. And since he is pure and since he is holy, he, he expects us because of the fact that at other instances he has told us that the purpose of religion or the purpose of all religious directives is to cleanse us from inside, to make us pure individuals. And he is selecting these individuals for the hereafter for a greater purpose, perhaps. So the word Al-Quddus actually ha should have this effect on us that like the Almighty, uh, who is very pure, and the fact that he would like us to remain pure, we also do these deeds which are pure. We don't indulge in evil. All kinds of of clean cleanliness, which of course includes physical cleanliness and spiritual cleanliness, should be our mission. And the next one is a salam, which means peace in entirety. And remember, this is the same word which we use when we greet each other, which we say assalamu alaikum. It is the same word. So God is a salam, He is peace in entirety. And therefore, He expects us to provide peace to others. We should not uh, be. Uh, against other people, we should not be trying, we should not try to let them down, we should not be, become their rivals. Our relationship with humanity, not with just Muslims, but with the whole humanity, has to be that we provide that peace. When someone meets us, he or she has this impression that he or she is meeting someone who is a well-wisher, someone who is deeply attached, he has no qualms. So this is what this uh, attribute must, uh, uh, the way it should influence us. And then it says Al-Mu'min. So he is not only peace in entirety, which is a salam, he is also a person who, who provides peace. He's the giver of peace. He makes us peaceful. He makes us uh, comfortable in our minds. You know what? The biggest peace that we can have is the peace of mind. And you have to realize that if you attach yourself to God, then look what God does to yourself, to you. To us, it says Al Mu'min. He gives you peace. Gives you the word Mu'min is from Aman. Aman, of course, you know in Urdu and in Arabic, it, it refers to peace. So it gives you that peace of mind. It gives you that solace. It gives you that comfort, which is 
more often than not missing in our lives. And then the next word is Al-Muhaymin, which means the guardian. So God is our protector. He protects us from all kinds of evil. He protects us from all kinds of bad designs of other people. Yes, at times he lets those things happen. But then again, that is for a purpose, for a scheme that he is undertaking, which is based on test and trial. But other than that, he is our real protector. So therefore, uh, when we pray to him, when we say that, please help us, please protect us, uh, there, there are people who are after us, we are actually reposing our trust in God. We are not knocking at the doors of other people or other deities uh, and asking them to do us a favor. What we are doing is we are consigning ourselves to the Almighty. And this has a tremendous feeling of, uh, of being protected. When you know that there's someone there watching over you, you feel that you are being taken care of. And now let's move on to the next uh, attribute. It says Al-Aziz. As you have seen, it's, it's called the, the Mighty One. So Aziz would mean that, that someone uh, whose might is such that no one can defeat him. No one can overturn his design. So if he has a scheme, if he has a plan to create this universe and to bring it to an end, it's not at all difficult for him. So you know there are people in this world and in the times of the Prophet, they said that how can Almighty, the, someone create this, this huge universe once again? And the answer that they get from the Quran is, well, didn't you see that God actually brought it forth the first time? So what can be done the first time can easily, easily be repeated. So Al-Aziz means that there is no one who can stop him. And then there is a word Al-Jabbar, which is uh, an enhanced form of Aziz, that he is all-powerful. So Jabbar, of course, tells us that there is no one who is more powerful than him. When he wants to implement his wish, when he wants to implement his desire, there is no one who, who can intercede for people against him. Then there's no. You see what happened was that in the times of the Prophet, uh, the idolaters of Arabia, the polytheists, they regarded angels to be daughters of God. And they thought that if they would, uh, they would please these daughters of God, which are the angels, then they would have an effect uh, with the all-powerful God and they will be able to convince him that they should not punish these people. So the Almighty says that he's al-Jabbar. He does not need, he, he does not have any strings attached to anyone. When he has to implement his will, he can do it. And he's the one and only in this regard. And then this Al-Mutakabbir. So Al-Mutakabbir means that he is the most high, the most high, which means that uh, if anyone can be regarded as the ultimate in uh, regarding exaltedness, it is God. So it actually is a, is a slant, a sarcasm on the fact that when we become arrogant, then when we cross our limits, uh, we, we actually pose ourselves to be higher than what we are. This is what arrogance is. So the Almighty is reminding us here that if is, if is there any, if there's anyone who can be called as Al-Mutakabbir or the person who has that actual honor or real honor, it's none of these are human beings. It's God Almighty. So Al-Mutakabbir is, uh, is an attribute which tells us that uh, being the ultimate and, and the person who's exalted is, is God only. None of us should show such pride or act in a way which is beyond our actual self, which of course is a very clear manifestation of arrogance and haughtiness. And then we have three very clear attributes coming right after one another, Al-Khaliq, Al-Bari, Al-Musawwir. So these are the three attributes which actually uh, refer to the stages of our creation. Khaliq here means he's the architect or he's the person who has designed us. So Al-Khaliq means a person who has designed us, who has laid the plans of how he's going to create human beings and other creatures. And then it says Al-Bari. Al-Bari means that someone who has actually created us. When the word Khalik and Bari, they, they come together in tandem, then the word Khalik actually means planning and the word Bari means coming, someone who brings someone into existence. And the word Al-Musawwir here means the modeler or the perfecter. So he's uh, someone who first imagines our creation, he designs it, then he brings that person into existence and then perfects it, which means that as human beings, perfection is given to us when the soul is injected into us, when we have this, uh, this uh, inclination and this proximity, as well as this awareness of the fact that what good and evil are, the Almighty has perfected our, 
our, our physical self and our spiritual self by equipping us uh, with all these details. So Al-Khaliq, Al-Bari, Al-Musawwar, actually, although they are uh, three separate attributes, but they occur in, in, a, in a sequence. So first it is a plan, then it's just execution, and then it's just the perfection of that plan. And then the verse also tells us that remember that all goods, good names are his, which means that these are not, not just the only names that you'll come across. These are not the only attributes that you'll come across. Every good attribute that, you, that comes to your mind exists in the Almighty to perfection. And then it says that Yusabbehu lahuma fis samawati wala, that every single person exalts the Almighty and gives glory to Him, every, everything which is between uh, the earth and the heavens. And lastly, we have the pair of Al Azizul Hakim, in which, of course, we've just discussed Azim. And the verse ends on Al Hakim. And Al Hakim, actually, as is clearly uh, evident, means the wise one. So God has a wisdom. And God has created this world with a purpose with a certain wisdom. And that wisdom, of course, is that he will call people to account. He will call people uh, to give uh, a description of what they did when they were given life. Because it is his wisdom which entails that he would do nothing which is meaningless. So if he has created this universe, and this universe seems to be a meaningless creation because the, uh, the consequence of evil is not always evil. And the consequence of good is not always good. So there seems to be something unwise going on in this world. But the Almighty has corrected that and said that this place is a world of test and trial. So the, the complete wisdom behind uh, the creation of this world is to try people and test people. And this can only be done by actually introducing different circumstances before different people. So you can clearly see, my dear friends and participants, that this is a very, very comprehensive introduction to God. And remember, all these attributes, they have a relation to us. It's, they just don't occur in the way as if it's, he's a, someone who's aloof to us or has no bearing to us. No, that's not the case. Each of these attributes has some link to us and we can relate to him vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis all these attributes. Okay, now let's go. Uh, come to the, the third uh, uh, part of our or the third discussion actually which is relates to the first verse number three and uh, in our comprehension questions we have actually covered question number two and four uh, at the same time because the influence and the list of attributes is something uh, which occurs in tandem and we should just discuss so we are here uh, on the last part now and this last part actually as, a, as again is the famous verse of uh, uh, of the Quran which we all know as Ayatul Kursi so Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum. It also has a lot of uh, basic things to convey to us that, for example, the, the, the knowledge of God, it says, Ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma What is behind us and what is in front of us, which means all our past and all our future is known to God. And there's no one who can intercede. Intercession means that there's no one who can come before him and say, well, you can forgive this person because he was good. Well, of course, he was not good. The Almighty says that no, he will not accept any intercession and only the, that intercession will be accepted which is based on the truth. And finally it says, Wasiya kursiyu samawati wal ard, that the kingdom of God extends this whole universe, all this universe. And he protects it and protecting this universe or overseeing it does not make him tired. It, it does not... Uh, uh, in, in the slightest way, uh, make him wary of, of, of uh, protecting this universe. So this was a very brief summary of this uh, third set of verses. Again, uh, we have some of the important attributes, as you can see. Uh, Allahu la ilaha illahu is, is the same clause that we have just studied, which means there's no God but He. And we have two special attributes being introduced, and that is al-hay al-qayyum, that He is the living and he is the sustainer, which means that he is there by himself and he is a means of bringing others into existence. Okay, the question that I have for all of you, for all of you regarding this passage is just one. And that actually relates to this second part of this verse, which is which says, La ta'khuzuhu sinatum wa la naum, which means neither slumber nor sleep overtakes him. Okay. So what exactly do you think uh, is the implication of the fact that neither slumber nor sleep 
overtakes him. He does not sleep. Okay, Zoya, we have, uh, we'd like to ask you because you raised your, raise your hand the first. Um, my thinking is this. So we know that with humans, we're never able to accomplish everything or do everything because we always succumb to sleep. We don't always, they, we always say there's 24 hours in a day, but there never really is because we spend so much of it asleep. Mm -hmm. um, and most of our lives we spend sleeping as well. But Allah does not have such restrictions on him. Mm -hmm. He is able to operate at all over all time and able to view and observe you mm -hmm. as well as to control what is happening in the world mm -hmm. without needing to rest at all. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that input, Zoya. Uh, so, Fatima and Ariba. So basically, I feel like this um, verse emphasizes the fact that he is not like any other kind who needs light or heavy sleep to function. Mm -hmm. So the speciality of not needing sleep shows that he is superior to all kinds and that there is no other that can compare to him. Okay, so it's like telling us that he is a unique, uh, he has a unique existence that like other people who have, who succumb to sleep, he does not succumb to sleep and this makes him uh, a perfect a perfect yeah. person or a perfect being. Yeah, and he's like superior to us. And like. superior to us. Okay. And uh, Amira? Yes. Um, so sometimes they say that when we go to sleep, that then we die. When we go to sleep, we lose consciousness or something. And then we're unconscious. We can't think when we're asleep. Mm -hmm. So like that, Allah, does, Allah has lived forever. Mm -hmm. So that means when they're saying that he doesn't need sleep or he doesn't need slumber, that means they... Um, that he doesn't he doesn't lose consciousness ever. Mm -hmm. He's always conscious. He's always he's always uh, overlooking us at every time. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you for that, Amira. Uh, anyone else? Uh, okay, Manahil. The others have mentioned um, we're not only like he's not only superior to us, but everything on this planet. You know, when we sleep, we're like vulnerable. He doesn't have a moment of vulnerability. He's always in control. Therefore, he's always going to be superior to us because eventually we're going to have to succumb to sleep. Okay. Uh, right. Anyone else? Uh, yes, Musa? Uh, sir, I feel like humans, if they are deprived of sleep, their qualities, they, they decrease. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I got what you have just said. God, he does not require sleep and uh, even without sleep, his quality... So all of us need sleep to refresh ourselves. Oh, that's what you're talking about. And God uh, does not need any such thing. And therefore, his abilities, whatever they are, they never decrease. They are at par and at, at an optimum level. Okay, that's a point that you've made. Okay, Sophia. Sophia, I think I'd like you to say something. Um, I think I agree with the others that we need sleep um, for to like for our, like our daily classes and things like that. Okay. Um, we need it for school and we need to have enough energy throughout the day to be ourselves. Yeah. Okay. And what about Sine? Um, besides what everyone else said, I think like the use of sleep as a metaphor, like I think it encompasses all sorts of like worldly constructs. Like he doesn't get hungry either. So like, Maybe they could have written that, but sleep is such a vital part of functioning. Okay. Okay. Uh, just let me give you a, some a slightly different insight. You've tried uh, your best, and I think uh, some of you are very close to the uh, actual understanding. Uh, you see, what one of the things that makes us uh, a person who violates the law is that we think that there's no no one watching us. And if we are told that there are 10 minutes in 24 hours in which there is no one who is going to uh, call us to account for our bad deeds, we will wait for those 10 minutes and do all kinds of bad stuff in, in those 10 minutes so that uh, in the rest of the time, because we know that we are being watched, uh, <coughs> uh, we would abstain. But those 5 or 10 minute windows which are being provided to us in the form of the fact that there is some time when, when the law is not there or when the accountability process is no longer going on. So that those five minutes are the ones in which we do all sorts of bad things. To give you an example, uh, at times we don't have these outages in light and electricity and therefore things are very normal and uh, they, they process in a, in a very normal way. But 
you have must have heard of uh, several incidents in which whenever there is a breakdown in light and there is of course uh, a total blackout the crimes increase a lot and in those in that particular blackout period you find a, a host of crimes being committed so in a very similar way what actually is the meaning of this verse is that there is not a single instant in which the almighty is unaware of what we are doing so when he when it says la takhuzuhu sinatun wala naum that he does not sleep it actually means that there is no time in which he is not watching over us because of course when he would have gone to sleep he would have this opportunity to do anything because we would know that god is not there to watch us so what actually is being conveyed is that there is not a single time in which god is not aware of what we are doing you just cannot uh, analogously think that the way we are god is also very similar to us no so as you've said that he has his attributes in which he he does not succumb to sleep and he is far superior to us of course that is the 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 the, the baseline that you have reached but above that the foundation above this foundation the whole building that uh, that needs to be constructed and understood is that as a result he is always watching over us always so never think that there is a time maybe a second or 10 seconds that he is not watching over us every single thing is his in knowledge and when every single thing is in his knowledge so therefore it will not be difficult for him to pinpoint any of the wrongs that we have done so basically it's an expression of his all embracing knowledge and the fact that he is aware of what's going on in the world that he has created and therefore all of us human beings we have to realize that all the time we are being watched by god so thank you very much my dear participants i think uh we had a very fruitful discussion remember this is our first part where well, this is our first introduction to god i would inshallah bring to you another set of verses which describes how the almighty interacts with human beings and how we can actually relate to him besides his attributes which we discussed today so you can see that ha- there are three things that we can uh through which we can know god one is his being about which we have been told that you, you know nothing about his being so forget about his being the other thing is his attributes and today we discuss these attributes so the third thing is his practices the way he behaves the way he has bound himself in certain laws uh, vis-a-vis human beings so inshallah we'll take a look at them in our next session and once again thank you very much for being with us uh, and i really enjoyed discussing these things with you and learning from you as well So inshallah we'll see each other uh, at the same time next Sunday take care of yourselves and it is khuda hafiz from your team